psychologist and clinical psychologist who's been in practice in Mobile for 22 years. Dr. Ogden has a PhD in clinical psychology from the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center at Dallas and completed a two-year postdoctoral fellowship in clinical neuropsychology. She is a board certified in clinical neuropsychology by the American Board of Professional Psychology. She holds an adjunct faculty appointment at the University of South Alabama in the Department of Neurology. Her practice focuses on performing psychological and neuropsychological evaluations of adults with neurological, medical, and psychiatric disorders in inpatient, outpatient, and, sorry, that's a lot, um, medical legal settings. Dr. Ogden has testified as an expert in clinical psychology and neuropsychology in state and federal courts. Welcome, Dr. Ogden. Thank you. Thanks for having me today. Um, I am a neuropsychologist. There's not many of us around. I think there maybe are four or five board certified neuropsychologists in the state of Alabama which sometimes leads to some confusion about what we do. I had a patient come in a while ago and said, she was there to see the psycho neurologist. <laughs> I was thinking, no, I know that guy, he's down the street. <laughs> You're stuck with me today. Um, but anyway, I do, I work with, gosh, oh, that's weird. Okay. <laughs> I work with um, people that have had various types of neurological injuries and illnesses. And um, brain injury is probably the most common um, comp-related injury I see. So today I'm gonna to be talking about mild TBI. Um, I cannot take credit for this clever title. That was all Kyle, but we were trying to keep up with the state fair theme here. So, um, first of all, there are over a million traumatic brain injuries in the United States every year, um, over 3,000 every day. That's a lot. Um, so this is a, a major health concern. Um, when we think about brain injury and determining whether or not someone sustained an injury, the, the characteristics of the injury always determine the severity. So it's not that someone comes in three months later and says, oh, I think I had a brain injury three months ago. You know, there has to be evidence at the time of injury that um, there was some kind of neurological disruption. And I'll, I'll talk more about that in a minute. I had a, a patient just this last week who told me that he had a history of traumatic brain injury. I said, oh, well, tell me about the injury. And he said, well, I don't know when it was. So what do you mean? He said, I was just told later that I'd had a brain injury because of symptoms that I had. I'm like, eh, it doesn't really work that way. But so I don't know what was that, that, that was. But um, so in order to conclude that a brain injury did occur, even in the mildest form, there must be some disruption of consciousness. The person doesn't have to be completely knocked out or entirely lose consciousness but there has to be some alteration in mental status. So a lot of times, especially with mild TBIs, people will talk about feeling confused or dazed at the time of impact. And that could last even just for a few seconds in the mildest form of injury, but it must occur in order for a subsequent brain injury diagnosis to be accurate. Um, the severity of the injury is always based on the injury characteristics. So whether or not somebody lost consciousness, how long they were unconscious, um, how long of a period around the injury do they not remember, um, and then trauma-related scores like the Glasgow Coma Scale score that EMTs and emergency department personnel do are important in determining the severity. So this is just a really simple way of um, looking at how injuries are rated. So you can see that even for a mild injury, someone can be unconscious at the scene of an accident or injury for up to 30 minutes and still be classified as a mild TBI. Um, the thing that's not on here is imaging studies. So in, in a mild TBI, by definition, there are not changes noted on a CT scan or MRI. So there's no evident bruising or bleeding in the brain. 
you can have the other characteristics a, a GCS of 13 to 15, a brief loss of consciousness, and a relatively brief um, period of post-traumatic amnesia, and have um, changes on the MRI, and that just bumps someone into a fourth category that we call complicated mild TBI. And I'm not going to talk about that a lot today, but it does change the, the expected prognosis a little bit. But for the most part, those injuries typically behave like a mild TBI. And as an aside, the term mild TBI is synonymous with concussion. So th those two are used interchangeably amongst medical professionals and in the literature. All right. So um, we want to know how severe someone's injury is because it helps us figure out what to expect over time. So obviously the milder injuries are expected to have a better prognosis than a more severe injury. So when we think about brain injuries as a whole, most brain injuries are mild. About 80% of the million plus injuries a year are mild, uncomplicated injuries. So this is the most common form of brain injury. So you'll hear um, the term post-concussion syndrome. And this is what um, a lot of workers are going to be experiencing after they've had a concussion or mild TBI. Um, it can range anything from physical, emotional, cognitive symptoms. And, and then sometimes it's confusing to the person who's experiencing the symptoms. Um, they may have you know, headaches one day and not the next day. Um, as you can see, there's a, a wide range of difficulties that someone could be experiencing in the initial period after a concussion or, or mild TBI. Have any, how many of you have worked with workers that have had concussions and mild TBIs? Okay, lots. It happens a lot. Okay, so most people that have a mild TBI have a complete recovery. This is really, this is probably the most important thing I'm gonna say today. Most people get 100% better within days or weeks. This is not expected to be a long-term disabling, debilitating injury, but we all know that it can be, right? <laughs> I'm getting to that too. Um, so the milder the injury, the faster somebody is expected to get better. And so that's why we wanna know the severity of the injury. And so we, it's really important to know, you know how, did the person lose consciousness? How long? What were the trauma scale scores? What did the imaging show anything? That kind of thing. Okay, so people getting worse over time is not an expected outcome. That's not brain injury related. The recovery curve is positive. Um, it does slow down over time, but for mild TBIs, it's pretty steep. So there, people are getting better pretty quickly in the absence of any complicating factors. Um, symptoms that persist for more than a year are really uncommon in mild TBI and should be raising some major red flags. Alarm bells should be ringing. Really symptoms persisting for more than a few months, especially in the, in the very mild injuries are, is very un, atypical from a strictly neurological perspective and cannot be explained by the injury alone. So what does explain the atypical outcomes? Um, most often, if you look at the literature here, psychological factors are at play. So emotional problems of some type are really common in people that have prolonged symptoms. It can be pre-existing emotional problems or problems that develop after the injury and cause prolonged symptom presentation. Physical pain is a factor. You know, a lot of people that have concussions or mild TBIs are injured in other ways as well. They may have orthopedic injuries and persisting pain. Um, from other 
aspects of their injury. Um, stress is, can be a factor. They're not going back to work. They're at home. They're fighting with their spouse. Things are coming unraveled. Um, litigation is a major factor. Um, studies in this area show that people who are involved in litigation have a worse outcome over time, um, psychologically and cognitively as well. And last but not least is the um, M word, malingering, um, which we all know happens, um, unfortunately, in some cases. So there is and has been, especially in my field, a belief that a certain percentage of people with mild TBI just never get better. And um, the literature used to refer to this group of people as the miserable minority. And for years and years, we believed that 20% of people who had mild TBIs just for whatever reason, never got better. Um, well, then about probably 20 years ago, psychologists started using what we call symptom validity tests. And I'm gonna talk more about this later. And so then we were able to look at the validity of complaints and problems and um, exhibiting the cognitive symptoms. And once we factor out people that are not putting forth adequate effort on cognitive tests or are misrepresenting themselves in some way, that miserable minority goes away. So it turns out the miserable minority is actually a group of people who have other factors that are affecting their presentation. It's not the brain injury that is creating the, the prolonged symptoms. So looking at people that go back to work, um, this, this graph is really interesting to me. So the bottom row is the mild TBI group. So you can see that at a month, 25% are back to work. At six months, two thirds are back to work. Um, 12 months, 80%. And then another year later, so there's that miserable minority, 20% just aren't, aren't getting back to work, but, and it's not because of the brain injury. Um, 24 months, so a year later, 80, only 3% more went back to work. What is ha happening? <laughs> Why, what is up with these 20% that are not getting back to work? right? Uh, I think we probably all know this to be true. And you know, that may not be 100%. And there are other factors, but, but this is a main one. And looking at the literature that has extensively studied this 20% that is not, not getting back to work, there is not consistent evidence of any other predictor. So this is really important too. So there's the 20%. So if we take out those that are entrenched in compensation seeking, then most are getting back to work and functioning and living their lives from an injury that does have a really good outcome for most people. Okay, so let's talk for a minute about malingering. I call it the M word because I think in, in my field, there's a reluctance amongst a lot of psychologists to use this word um, or to put it in writing. Um, and patients don't like it when we use that word <laughs> in writing. Um, and that may be why people don't wanna use it, I'm not sure. But it is defined as the intentional production of symptoms or it can also be just intentionally exaggerating your symptoms. So they could have legitimate problems, but they're just exaggerated um, for some sort of external incentive. In most cases, it is financially based, but not always. Um, there are other incentives too. You may be receiving care from a loved one or um, 
obtaining medications is one, unfortunately. Um, avoiding prosecution. There are um, other reasons. Avoiding work. Okay, so the base rates of malingering in mild TBI, 40%. So four out of 10 people that have a mild TBI meet the, the established criteria for malingering. That's shocking. And it's significantly higher than a moderate to severe TBI. So people with the more severe injuries are exaggerating their complaints much less often than people with the milder injuries. Um, other high rates, chronic pain, I don't know why toxic exposure is so high, and um, or in criminal evaluations where the person is attempting to evade prosecution but that's only 14% higher than mild TBI. So this is a problem. And, and this is why as a neuropsychologist, a part of every evaluation I do is to assess for this possibility. Um, we are always looking for pieces of data where neuropsychologists are data geeks. If you've seen any reports from a neuropsychologist, you know, there's lots of numbers and data that we use to make conclusions about someone's brain functioning. So we're looking to see if things make sense. Um, does the data that the person produces on cognitive testing or psychological testing match with what we would expect from a mild TBI? Um, so we do what's called validity testing, and these are specific ways that we use to evaluate the um, genuineness of someone's complaints or cognitive symptoms. So you'll hear terms like symptom validity tests, performance validity tests, um, effort tests. They used to be called malingering tests, but we don't use that terminology anymore. And they should be in every report. So if you are sending someone to see a neuropsychologist or a psychologist, and they are not using validity measures, that is a big problem because they are leaving this possibility, this 40% um, possibility of malingering or disingenuous presentation uninvestigated. So it, it has to be a consideration especially in a compensation seeking setting. And the other reason to use it is, you know, I wanna make sure that the data that I collect is used accurately. If I'm making conclusions based on wonky data, then I get a, a inaccurate conclusion. So we have to ensure that the data that we use is valid. Okay, um, so just as a quick aside, um, this bottom line is really important. Test findings, so when someone comes to see me, they're doing a series of cognitive tests. Sometimes it takes a couple of hours. It's a lengthy process and it requires someone to engage. It's not like laying at an MRI machine. They have to actually do the testing and ideally to the best of their ability so that we get a, an accurate reading of how their brain is functioning. And our test findings are 10 times more affected by effort than they are by a severe TBI. So someone who's not trying or not putting forth their best effort or is attempting to look more impaired than is actually the case will, will look impaired on the testing uh, or can. But, and if we don't have the validity testing, you, might, you could easily make an inaccurate conclusion about how their brain is functioning. It's very easy to feign psychological conditions. Um, anybody can Google diagnostic criteria for PTSD, post-concussion syndrome, depression, you name it. And psychological and psychiatric diagnoses are based on 
the, the symptoms and the self-report of the person who's experiencing those symptoms. So if they say they're experiencing you know, nightmares, um, flashbacks for, in the instance of PTSD, for example, a lot of doctors will just take that at face value, check the box and move on. And then they end up getting a diagnosis of PTSD. And that's why looking at the um, validity of someone's self-report is really important. Um, it's very easy to come up with symptoms of TBI. And I think this is what happened with the patient I mentioned earlier, that he went to a doctor, he reported symptoms of a TBI, and the doctor said, oh, you had a TBI, even though he never had a TBI. So um, it's easy to come up with the symptoms and report them. Um, and that's why it's really important to assess the validity. Okay, so back to these people that are still reporting symptoms way past the time where they would have ideally been better and back to work. Um, malingering is one main reason for this, but it's not the only reason. There are other explanations for atypical outcomes. Um, this is a list of some. Um, there's you know, misattribution of symptoms. So sometimes people will um, have a headache, for example, and they'll say, oh, I've got this headache and it's gotta be because of that concussion I had eight months ago. And I'm like, well, okay, did you ever have headaches before the injury? Yeah, I did, I'd have them a couple of times a month. Okay, well, how often are you having them now? A couple of times a month. I'm like, oh, okay, well, that's probably a misattribution that you know, you've, you've had these before and you're still having them. Um, the good old days bias, I see this a lot of um, patients who come see me with a family member and the family member says they were a, a genius before they had this brain injury. They were in Mensa, they, you know, all these things. And then I test them and their, their IQ is average, which is nothing wrong with that. And like, they're like, oh, that's just gotta be a huge decline. I'm like, no, you know, there's really not evidence of a decline. So. Uh, that's the good old days bias. Um, as a typo, it should say iatrogenic, not latrogenic. Um, this is kind of what I was describing earlier, where people around somebody, um, a, a physician, for example, may say, oh, I think you know, you've had uh, this very serious brain injury. You need to go home and sit in your room for you know two weeks and dark and don't look at your phone or talk to anybody. And it, people get worried and upset as a result of the information they may receive from treating providers who are well-intentioned, um, but the information conveyed creates stress. Psychological variables are really important. Um, for whatever reason, people who have pre-existing depression, anxiety, personality disorders, or somatization tendencies, tend to have a prolonged symptom presentation. So that's always something important to understand is what the person brings to the injury because it does definitely affect the outcome on the back end. So how do we prevent mild TBI from becoming a persisting problem? Has anyone worked with a worker who's had persisting problems? Oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> all right. So I may need to get some ideas from you all. You probably have some good ones. Okay. So first is trying to figure out who is going to be at risk for having a bad outcome over time. And sometimes we, we don't know, but other times I'm really impressed with you guys, case managers, adjusters, I mean, you've, you guys have been around a long time and worked with a lot of people. And I think more often than not, you kind of know, it's like your spidey sense <laughs> is tingling. Something is awry here. And I know that's true because a lot of times I'll get referrals that come with an apology. Oh, I'm sending you Mr. Jones. Really sorry about that. Like, okay. <laughs> That should be interesting. 
Um, so you know, you know that something is up and sometimes it's really obvious and other times it's not so obvious, but um, trust your instincts here. But here are some things that have shown up in the literature that are risk factors for a bad outcome. Don't know why, whatever reason, having a lower education level, which the studies have defined as less than 11 years, tends to be associated with a lower rate of return to work following concussion. Uh, manual labor, work responsibilities um, are less likely to return to work. Having a, in, a physical injury in addition to the TBI, of course, because a lot of times those um, injuries can keep someone out of work for, for non-TBI related reasons. People who don't have strong social support are less likely. Older people, and, and that's kind of true across the board. I think the older we get, unfortunately, the less um, quickly we recover from injuries and the more likely things are to kind of hang around. Um, here's the next one, big one. Lots of symptom report at the onset. Um, these are the workers that are just, you know, filling up the form and that we have fill out in the waiting room with, you know, lots and lots of symptoms. And then for whatever reasoning, reason, um, nausea and vomiting at the time of injury is associated with a longer um, symptom presentation and mild TBI. And I'm not really sure why that is. The one that I didn't put on here that I think is, is really important is the presence of anger and resentment, especially at the employer. This is really big. Um, a lot of times, I think injured workers feel that their injury was handled in a way that they don't like. They're mad that they didn't get flowers at the hospital or whatever. They're, they're just mad at the employer. They're upset that they're hurt. And that is associated with a worse outcome, whether it's from mild TBI, really, or injury comp, or any comp related injury. If they're mad, they're way more likely to have a bad outcome and they're way more likely to seek legal representation. It's sort of parallel to, there have been some studies looking at um, which doctors get sued. And what the research shows is that if a patient likes their doctor, even if they're a terrible doctor, they're way less likely to sue the doctor than if they didn't like the doctor, even if he or she practiced amazing medicine. So there's a lot to be said for what the claimant thinks and, or feels about the employer and the, and the injury itself. Okay, so what can we do to prevent this prolonged out of work status? Um, if we can address risk factors, obviously we can't change the age or education level of the, of the worker, but there may be things that, that can be changed. Um, I think the last one, you know, the anger and resentment is one especially that um, can sometimes be addressed um, in creative ways if the employer is willing, willing to do that. Um, providing education regarding expected outcome is huge. There was a study back in the, I think, 90s. It's been around for a long time by a Canadian psychologist named Wiley Mittenberg. And what he did, we went to the emergency department. And anytime someone came in with a concussion, he talked to them about their injury. And he told them, you're going to have these symptoms, but they're only going to last for a short period of time, and you are going to get 100% better. You will be fine from this injury. And the people that got that very simple intervention had a huge, hugely significant better outcome over time. And so just simply, and I think this does happen way more now in ERs and urgent cares. Um, and in primary care offices, thankfully, 
But that message is so very important. And I think that's something that we can all continue to deliver, that this is an injury from which you will recover. And I say that all the time. And I sometimes I hear, but I'm not getting better and um, that kind of thing. But the, the education is key and, and can really make a big, big difference. Um, the employer's support for the injured worker is also really important. Um, and this, this can look um, different depending on the circumstances of the injury or of the worker. Um, a lot of times when I'm working with someone and they're trying to get back to work, you know, I might recommend that they do so gradually. You know, maybe they start off going to work for two hours a day for a week, and then they bump up to four, and then six, and then eight, and you know, kind of gradually get back to the workplace. And some employers are really willing to accommodate that, and some aren't. And you know, so little things, I think, with with these types of workers that are struggling to get back to work can make a, a big difference. Um, having a worker be able to leave work to go to a doctor's appointment without punishment or penalty can be really helpful. Um, any kind of accommodations that can take place in the workplace, you know, if they feel like they're still um, tired or fatigued, allowing for breaks um, every hour, a couple of hours, you know, certainly within reason, but the employers that will agree to these kind of things, in my experience, tend to have a better success at, at getting the more challenging, difficult, prolonged presentations back in the workplace. Oh, all right. <laughs> that was my last one. <laughs> All right, I'm, I can take some questions if anybody has any. Okay. Oh. Yes, she asked um, about non-English speaking workers who have had an injury and is it more challenging to evaluate the situation? Yes. <laughs> yes, it is. A lot of the, thankfully, you know, I, I'm not bilingual, but um, a lot of the tests that we use um, both to assess cognition and to set, assess validity are available in other languages now, especially Spanish and some of the more commonly spoken languages. So um, it can be done. Yeah. Anything else? Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> right. Yes. Okay, she's asking, where do you send these people? I, I think I'm going to get cut off here in a second. Um, okay, so that's a really good question. The All right, someone like me, a neuropsychologist or a psychologist. Now, I know for, uh, for you guys, that raises concern, like, oh, no, black hole of psychology. Um, and it can be that, but it doesn't have to be that. Um, so if you, if you have someone who is exhibiting some of these warning signs that you sense is, is not getting back to where they need to be, you know, certainly intervention from a neuropsychologist or a psychologist can be really helpful. Three or four sessions of cognitive behavioral therapy oftentimes can turn this process around and get somebody back on track. Sometimes I'll, I'm willing to admit that it's very challenging in some cases and it, you know, I give my best shot and it just, you know, it doesn't work. But um, simple cognitive behavioral therapy education can in some cases help and it doesn't have to be a prolonged process. Usually a few sessions can, can work. So in, investigate your psychologist or neuropsychologist up front and then try that. <laughs> All right, I think I'm done. Thank you guys. <laughs>